This is surely a subject uh, adjusting IOL power in the post uh, laser refractive patient is obviously something that uh, affects all of us who do cataract surgery today. I do have some disclosures. I mean, I think all of us recognize that the LASIK era or the eczema laser era has really changed the, the paradigm for how patients look upon any anterior segment surgery. Uh, so they all want to see through walls, basically, is the challenge that we have. This and was a picture of Sam, actually, when he first started practice. <laughs> <laughs> you see the ass on the chest? <laughs> <Sam>. <laughs> Um, and uh, this is a, a group of individuals who've already kind of spoken with their wallet. They've paid money for the purpose of being spectacally independent earlier in their life. So they do represent a significant challenge to us. And wrong optical power in this group of patients tends to be a very big source of satisfaction, dissatisfaction and probably the main reason for IOL exchange in this group of individuals. If we take a look at the current state of cataract surgery, there are a couple of papers on what is uh, expected or the routine. And in fact, the lower of the two papers uh, would kind of set the standard for the NHS in the UK, and that is 55% of eyes within a half diopter of expected outcome and 85% within one diopter. And fortunately, with biometry and the routine patients and what have you, uh, particularly with laser interferometry, we're doing much better but that is what's considered the standard. Contrast that with the LASIK individual, uh, and there, the published data indicates 93% of patients are within a half diopter of their target, and 98% see 2025 um, uh, with uncorrected distance vision. So that, that's kind of a change in the mindset from the roughly half of the patients to nearly all of the patients who expect to be within a half diopter. And the people who have had uh, photoablative surgery fall into this group rather than into to the former group. So that's where our challenge rests. Now, there are kind of six A's that I look at that we, that we need to do in order to achieve satisfaction in the cataract-based patient. And two are particularly important here in dealing with this situation, that is having accurate biometry and using the appropriate formulae. Um, uh, what can go wrong? Uh, I think we've got Warren Hill and Tom Olson who can tell us lots to answer that. What can go wrong in trying to figure out the power in general? But all formulae have this one thing uh, that they all fail, what I call the original sin, and that is they all assume that they know where the lens is going to sit. And then we've got biometric errors. We've got problems with uh, uh, anterior corneal dystrophies, <coughs> staphylomata, silicone oil, and there's always human error mixed in. But then uh, the post-refractive surgery corneal curvature, th this is something that, uh, that plagues us. And I think it's also very important that people recognize that all corneal refractive procedures do not have the same effect on our measurement of corneal power. The photoablative procedures are significantly different than the incisional procedures. Uh, if we look at these uh, schematically, here on the upper left, this is uh, an eye that's had nothing done. So we see the anterior and posterior corneal curvatures are, are quite parallel and similar. Whereas in the upper right, this is the effect of radial keratotomy or incisional surgery, and that is to weaken the peripheral cornea. The net effect is to flatten the central cornea, but the surfaces remain roughly parallel. The relationship between anterior and posterior corneal curvatures is unchanged by incisional surgery. Contrast that to the myopic ablative procedure photoablative procedure where we've kind of lopped off the anterior surface of the cornea. I know that LASIK surgeons don't like to think in those terms, but effectively we've, we've planed off the anterior surface, but we've not affected the back surface. So we now have a difference in the relationship of the anterior and posterior curvatures. Uh, and in distinction to that is the hyperopic photoablative patient where we've steepened the anterior surface and still left the back cornea unchanged. So those relationships have changed in a different way. Now, we got into trouble when we used our standard ways of measuring eyes and people have had photoablative surgery because in the original Gullstrand models, we assumed a back uh, corneal power of approximately 5.88 or six diopters. So that when a patient was uh, at a keratometer or an automated 
topographer and you would read a 42 diopter cornea, in reality, what you're reading is something entirely different. It's an anterior surface of 48 diopters and a back surface of minus six. Um, and then when you change those relationships, when they're no longer near parallel, things happen. Um, and so what happens is that the, the effect is to overestimate, with a standard device, you will overestimate the power of the cornea and with, um, in someone who's had a myopic ablative procedure, and you will um, underestimate it in the patient who has had a hyperopic procedure. And the nice thing about this is there is somewhat of a mathematical relationship, and it's pretty, pretty close. That's a relationship. The more treatment that has been done, the greater that you will affect the relationship or the ratios of the anterior and posterior curvatures. So in managing the problem, as in everything else in life, knowledge is power. The more you know about the patient, the more you can work around what to do. History of treatment, history of the change in the refractive era, history of the change in the corneal curvature will help you. When you don't have that, then you have to get to more clever ways, assumptive formula, or new and evolving technology such as OCT, and uh, we, we're involved in that. We look forward to see how that works. What, what struck me, and this probably goes back 10 years or so when in dealing with these patients, was that I, I just noted uh, empirically that we had approximately a one diopter or um, error in our myopic patients. They would come out, if we used standard formulae, and we went and did their surgery, uh, we were getting about a diopter of hyperopic undesired postoperative refractive outcome for roughly each three diopters of laser treatment. And so we accumulated 30 patients. Uh, we adjusted them according to this. We established um, a, uh, this formula. And in fact, what we were able to come up with this regression analysis was that if we adjusted by this certain amount, we would come out pretty darn close to, to emetropia. And the nice thing about adjusting the IOL calculation just by the amount the patient was treated was that we didn't have to figure out what was the effect on the cornea or use any fancy instrumentation. All we would do was, was do um, our standard biometry, and then if we knew and we needed to know how much laser treatment had been applied to the eye, we could use the regression analysis and come up with a simple uh, correction. Um, and we published this subsequently uh, in 2006, in fact, and interestingly enough, this very simple formula has held up as, as uh, the, among the most accurate over the years. The one major deficiency is that you need to know the amount of laser treatment. And so again, knowledge is power. In the original 30, and we've done obviously many, many more eyes since this, um, and this is both for hyperopic, myopic ablatives, we had nearly half of the patients were emetropic, and 28 out of the 30 were plus or minus 50. And here's how the formula works. Uh, here, the uh, patient uh, who has had an, uh, a prior myopic ablation, we read uh, either on the lens star or the IOL master or by um, immersion ultrasound. Formula SRKT says you need a 16 diopter lens for emetropia. We know that the patient's had six diopters of photoablative myopic treatment. We multiply minus six by the formula. Minus times minus comes out plus, and lo and behold, we add two diopters, so the final power would be 18. Conversely, on the hyperopic patient, uh, the patient's had three diopters of prior treatment. A plus times a minus yields a minus, so we adjust down by one diopter. Um, uh, what we did, we also validated this for several other formulas. I had a fellow visiting from Turkey who looked at, at a number of formulas uh, and we establish a specific regression formula for each of them. And uh, in the Blue Journal uh, in 2011, the May issue, uh, they looked at a no I think there were 11 formulae that they looked at, and the ones that they found that were the, uh, the most accurate uh, of the ones out there turned out to be uh, the one that we published and the one that John Shamas has published. And both of these are available on the uh, ASCRS website, which Warren was really uh, integral in, in formulating, he in fact made a modification to mine. He put a very slightly higher regression analysis on it, but uh, these formulae are, are available 
um, on the ASCRS website. And because the Shamus and the form that we published turn out to be the most accurate, Hog Strite has chosen to put that uh, on the Lens Star. The, the Shamus was on last year, and now subsequent to this, uh, the, the formula that, that we publish will be uh, available on, on the Lens Star for you. And the worksheet is very simple. You just enter in the amount of the laser procedure that was done, and it will print out uh, a series of different answers for you based upon the Holiday One, which has been validated in the ASCRS website. So just in summary, again, these are a very challenging group of patients. They are demanding uh, because they have already voted with their wallets. And um, we have to be, you know, obviously very vigilant in how we determine their lens power. And so um, I think we now have opportunities to do this. And it's an evolving field, and so there will be more and more available to us over, uh, over the years, plus adjustable technology and what have you. So thank you so much for attention. And I'm sorry, but I do have another meeting, so I want to take questions now if yeah. there are any. Uh, please, any questions from the audience? Yeah, Sam, I have a couple of questions for you. Fire. Does this uh, change how you select your implant lenses in either previously hyperopic or previously myopic LASIK? The formula or in terms of looking at asphericity or what have you? Well, go ahead. Take it as you wish. Okay. Well, interestingly enough, I mean, uh, this is a, <laughs> even though this is very now old but apparently valid technology, um, there's, some now, there's some studies now that are showing that they can calculate um, IOL power alteration based upon aberometry. Um, it's kind of interesting, but it seems to be a, in another evolving technique. But in terms of uh, what type of lens to use based upon prior ablation, um, it kind of makes sense in the, the prior myopic, particularly the older algorithms, where they're kind of like hockey puck treatments. You really want to use lenses that induce negative asphericity, whereas just the opposite would occur uh, if you're going to deal with patients who've had prior hyperopic ablations, they really should probably not have more. They have already built in negative asphericity in their cornea. They've got this oblate cornea, so you know, or this prolate cornea, rather. Do you find any difference in the predictability of the adjustment formulas, whether you select a lens which has built in sphericity, either positive, negative, or neutral? Haven't looked at that. I think that there, there might be an answer there, but I haven't looked at it. 